Okay, today we should talk about large language models. This is an area of machine learning that has had a big splash in the media and in our applications the last year or so. Uh, and most famous is ChatGPT. That basically is a model that for predicting, uh, commu communicating with the computer. So I will, but it has also been applied quite successfully to problems in biology. So I will try to make an overview here, and then in the paper you read, you get a bit overview of what things are, have done there. So some of the most famous example is the ESM set of, of um, protein models that was developed by Meta or Facebook, uh, particularly by Alexander Rives. And they are now closed down that one, so they have an independent company doing that. And then there's a Bot T5 and other methods that are Bot Bert is one that are developed by Berka Drost, so the academic version of it. But it's also been used for Omega Fold. This is a, a, another uh, folding program. And actually, also both Alpha Fold and Rosetta Fold uses it as a part of their training. So it has been involved in many things for a long time. So let's start. So they, what, you, what, you, what you do here. It's basically you want to predict predict uh, always a part of a text in some way or another. And of course, the, the conclusion here is basically that you have location between sequence and text is that for the sequence and for the text is that my well, basically is letters. Basically, you can divide things into letters or words and then to sentences. So, and there are connections between different words. So if you start talking what's on end, you know your word would be quick. The next word, but at the same time, if you have a certain amino acid combinations, you know something of what the next amino acid should be. And so there are there are clear connections that you could use the me methods developed for text recognition, also for proteins. Uh, and the properties can in both cases be both more local, so like the words are next to each other are related, and the letters next to each other are related. But it can also be more global, uh, global. So, like, if you just take the number of words of a certain type of certain exams and test something about the topic, or something like that, my test certain language, and certainly, but also certainly if you have a lot of hydrophobic amino acids, it's likely to be memory proteins. So, you certainly are, are information that can be both local and global. So, the first thing you have to do in in if you do work in a sentence, you have to tokenize things, and of course, you could do different things. You could actually do every letter in the word. I think most methods that do work works works on words nowadays. So they sort of words and even group words together that mean the same thing. You mean <coughs> cat and feline might be the same thing, or you put it together somehow. So like that's some that's a tokenization. But in general, for proteins, you actually do it on amino acid level. So you have like a MST, I say. But you could do it for you you could do it for uh, uh, Pairs, so I mean, as a triple also, if you want to do things like that. But in print, I think most things use synchronization, but you need to do some kind of organization. And then you have to define the reference, refer refer uh, uh, the representation somehow. For if you want machine learning, you can just do a the simple thing is bag of words vectors. So basically, you say how many times they find a sort of word, how many times they find a sort of amino acids. So you have, of course. In, in the number of words, it, it, the dimension is very high because there are a lot of possible words, but of course, the amino acid is only 20. So basically, you can just calculate the amino acid frequencies of 20 and you use that for the input so machine learning, say later. So this is like the old type of way. It's, it's not a large language model, but it's still done. And you can do things uh, other ways. You can use also use, use like one, one hot encoding and so on. So, of course, the idea of these things is that you don't use this bag of words, but the idea is that you basically, in all this, that you do some kind of Training, or you do a pre training, fine tuning, but basically the idea is to take prediction of a missing word. So, in this case, would you tell me <laughs> which way I <laughs> to go from here? You want to learn, it's very likely that the word should be please first and what in the second sentence. So, basically, you try to learn that, and then of course, you can do that, and that's what ChatGPT does basically. But you mask words. You get early methods did it for next word, but your previous words, you can do one way direction, or you can use random words, you can use more than one word, you can longer sentences and so on. But that, and of course, that is of course a feedback and training how, how you do this. And then, then it's often the second step is actually fine-tuning. So you can actually do that, for instance, in, in word in, in text mining, if you do it for instance, if you want to tune it to be better at discussing biological science papers, 
you do a general training on, on every, all, all the literature that exists, but then you do a special fine tuning training on, on, on biological literature, for instance. And the same thing you can do for proteins, you can do basically do, if you do a model for something for that, then you can fine tuning of something that is more specific for the protein you work on. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there has been a lot of work on this, as I said. Simple way, we we'll do a bag of words, just put things together. And then you had embeddings of these words, and you, know, you have what's called bidirectional endless stems and endless stems. I'll tell you a bit more on them later. But nowadays, most of things are working on what we call transformers. So we, I think, we already discussed in the alpha for paper, it was even formal, but here it's it's clearly the idea of a transformer. And here, the key step in, in a form is, is what's called attention. So basically, you have an input and an output, and you shuffle right, shift right here, and, and you have an attention position, basically you, you, you basically have all the positions are telling how much does influence another one. And this is something you learn also. So I will go a bit more into detail on this in a second. So here it's like, yeah, this is early methods. Like uh, this traditional algorithm language model says you have MLV and you pick next step. You pick the next step towards M. M is basically a probability of finding the next step as you give in as you four, and you can look at sort of window things like that. And that's quite easy to train. But of course, it, it only goes one direction. So if the first letter, well, maybe this was tiny, but like the second one is to not as much variation, but you learn later. Uh, yeah. Then people did by, by directional, it's basically the same thing. You have probability going in both directions, and you can weight these vectors together. And nowadays, what people use is sort of masks. Like you, you mask out one sentence or some sentence. I think in alpha fold, they, they mask out 50% of the rest of you, something like that. So that's often you mask out it randomly selected one, and you try to predict them as part of your training model. Uh, yeah, and you can do this. So this is an example from Bonnie Berger, from one of the papers here, is that you basically take it, you can take it, you, you do some encoding here. So basically you take, what you do is you take your mask things, you have excess here, and then you get an encoder. So basically you, you basically tell an embedding of what is the likelihood, what, 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 what should I have here? So but it's not just the amenace, but it tells you something about how things connected. And this one, you can then encode to a vector. And then you can basically take two of these vectors together, and you, uh, well, the same, in this case, the same two times, and, and instead of putting them in assets directly, you put in this narrow network encoder, and you can do this pretty context. Uh, and you can do it for one sequence, pretty context, or you can do it for two sequences. So it will be the same thing, you can find two. Uh -huh. So this is basically what we did in content prediction earlier in Outfold, but instead of putting in an MSA, you put in an encoding of a single sequence. And uh, that is actually been proven to be quite useful uh, and actually quite good. So I will talk a little bit about that later. But you can do it for one sequence or for two sequences. As you can see here, in this case, we sort of kind of typical. It's like for one sequence, you actually get nice contact map predicted, while the one with two is much more diffuse and much noisy. And it, because it sort of hasn't learned the same thing, of course, it only learns one sequence at a time. But it can also be used for other things. I mean, can, this is one thing in context, but it can also be used for like, you can for instance just take some very stupid thing, I, I would imagine, if you take these vectors, these embeddings, and uh, you then summarize them for every position. So you basically have 2024, let's just say like the average. And then you can, show, you can actually use that for, for classifying proteins in different ways. You can classify them, in this case, you classify them for different folds. You can basically look at these embeddings, and say, ah, oh, is this, is this belong to fold one, two, three? And this actually is quite good at it. It's actually as good as hammer, not their top of the slide state methods for that. Because it basically recognizes the features of a process. But it can also be used as an input for subcellular localization predictions and such and like that. So it has been quite sure that these embeddings sort of uh, catch information that is beyond the just sequence of information of a protein. Uh, and as I said, what you, you can do to improve these predictions is actually do what you call fine tuning or transfer learning. You train it on something general, and then you take it uh, on you fine tune something specific. So in this case, exercise or training model dogs or uh, yeah, dogs and wolves, and then you fine tune to train on cats or type of different cats to recognize it. And so you can see here that you have. This is example member protein prediction here, where you have top cons, which actually happens to be my old method that uh, had an 80% accuracy, 
And then you have so that you can do this with this language model. You can actually adopt the eighty-eight percent accuracy in the method method to do it. And this is this is actually in this case, I guess, it's only classification of protosynthesis it's not bringing support you directly. Uh, and you can also, for instance, predict it for for predicting uh, in this case uh, uh, effect of mutants. You basically run a mutant and see what happens in the bad when I sh change one amino to something else. And then you can see, okay, and I train this and fine tune it, and I can say, oh, is this mutant making it more stable, less stable, etc. It's a bit small, but yeah. So here, as I said, the different things that you had this word vector, but in the key thing is a transformer here that you will have an extra discussion about later. So you have an, we have an input and output sequence, and uh, you really have the attention that sort of brings things together. But it's just uh, several transform blocks after each other, which is also the other things to do. So as I said, this is a key paper called attention also need. But the key attention module is that you have a, a module which is basically you have a key, a query, a key, and a vector. And these are basically you optimize them by multiplying by this vector V, this attention vector here. And you can actually you, you do this actually in a matrix form, but you have a soft max with maximum everything together. So basically you have a vector here, which means that the metric has sort of learned to focus on the things that are important. And as it, this is the paper it's called Attention Always You Need, that was from 2017, something like that. And uh, it's a key paper for influential transformer, and it has really increased performance significantly. Yeah, you can do it in several layers. You can do multi you can do all one, so you can do the several. Uh, has a... So let's go to a bit of application here. So Omega, and as the example here, the idea here is basically it's alpha fold, more or less, and then you just replace the MSA input with an, this ESM embedding. So here you can see that you have, uh, you see, you can kind of play the content map very accurately. This is one side is the predicted one is the real contact that. And you can see that the, the performance, in this case, the claim increased the bigger and bigger ESM. So you have a number of parameters. So if you have a billion parameters, you do better than if you have a million, etc. So you, but it's somehow around a billion parameters. With this. And if you remember, a billion parameters is actually significantly more than, uh, um, than uh, other full users. Other full has something like 90 million parameters. So it's, 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 language models are extremely uh, parameter rich. It's also very extremely expensive to train. So people have trained them for months on big clusters. They're really expensive. And chat GPT, you don't want to know how much uh, they're trained on. And an interesting fa factor here is uh, uh, that the performance uh, here, measured in another way, is significantly also improved by parameters. Uh, and uh, you can see also that it ha if the more hits you have with MM6, so basically the, the more multiple similar sequences you have in your database, performance increases. So that means that for a sequence where that is rare, where, you, where the MM6 will be, will be very shallow, performance is bad, but for a sequence that's called free, has a lot of homologs, the performance increases. So sort of what that means indicates is that the embedding learns the MSA somehow. And here they compare, next of all, they compare the ESM2, the team score, with uh, well, basically the biggest parameter, they say the always bigger, so it's better. And then you see that the number of cases would actually predict the structure quite accurately for um, doing that. To be fair, the performance is not better than overall, even not even for single sequences, but it is often comparable. So it's slightly better. And of course, it's, if you skip one step, you don't know to do, need to do MSA. So in cases where you know that that is faster. So that's and then minus ESM fold in this case. Omega fold is basically the same, not the same thing, but it, it's a similar idea. It's a different implementation. They have a number of tricks. I think that I do that different, but like in principle, the idea is that you start from embedding. Uh, yeah, so as I said, well, here's the description of ESM folds. You have the embedding here. The thing is, because you have the ESM embedding, you have a folding trunk and the structure models. That's basically the EVA formula fold and the, and the structure model, and the structure. And uh, it's very triangle updates. It's very, very simple to unfold. Uh, there are, I don't know if there actually is any differences really. 
Um, and you see the performance here is that, yeah, it's slightly worse now. For, it's like 0 0.65, 0 0.85 to 5. And that, but there are cases where it's better, case, but, but in general, it's the, no, it's not doing that bad. Mm. Uh, it's yeah, uh, correlation with other fault performance is very high. You have a P, the closest, I mean, it does better for things that have the PDB structure than normal, there, than things that are far away. It does worse, does worse off. Um, it can find things that are. Uh, um, so it's, it might does they applied this to something like uh, eight hundred million sequences, something I think they did, which is was much faster because you didn't do, do you did not have need to do eight hundred million MSAs, which was doable, and uh, they found novel folds that are not not similar to anything else in in the database. So they, lo they did all the meta genomic sequences, so you can download that today if you want. Um, and there are cases here where you have new you know, cases where you do high, quite high, uh, not, not sure they're correct, but high likely, high scoring predictions for things that have no refs, nothing in the unit ref at all. So there are no sequences. And there are cases where new foster predictions are uh, better with the ESM form. Yeah. Um, and we have used another application, which is an example here, where we basically has also used this embedding for something in this case, which is pretty metal ions. And we just take, in this case, take this uh, vector in uh, ESM vector, we, we use different ones. We use the ESM, MSA, or that's a, their similar performance. One is, happens to be better than another for some reason. But, uh, and then we just look at one direction at a time, but it is an embedding vector, and do that for predicting uh, if a pressure is are you a metal binding or not? And uh, what metal is binding in that case? And we can show that this method performs as well as anything else, basically, or there's a very simple method. It's, and also we can do it for more type of uh, metals than other people have done before. Okay, that's it for today.